I'm Becca King-Reed on top of Mount Hamilton at the Lick Observatory. We're going to take you inside and give you a peek at a telescope that was built here way back in the 19th century. Of course, astronomers are still up here studying the heavens, and we'll show you some of those newer telescopes as well. Hi atop Mount Hamilton. Joining us is Dr. Ellie Gates, an astronomer here. Dr. Gates, what a view. It is. It's an amazing view up here and an absolutely amazing place to do astronomy. It must be fabulous in the evening. You must be able to see as far as, as the telescope can see, I guess. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> now, this, this is some installation, and it looks like it was pretty hard to build it here. Tell us the story of how this came to be here. Well, it's quite a long story, actually. Uh, it starts with James Lick, who was a very wealthy businessman in San Jose in the Bay Area uh, back in the 1870s, and he wanted a monument to himself so he would be remembered. And he decided an astronomical observatory would be a wonderful way to be remembered. And he gave about $700,000, which is equivalent to about $1.2 billion today, uh, and to build the greatest telescope in the world. Uh, it started in 1876 with just building a road to the top of the mountain. Then in 1880, blasting 70,000 tons of rock off the top of the mountain to make a flat area to build a building. In 1880, they were, or 1881, they were ready to start building the building. In 1887, the telescope was finally ready to be installed. And finally, in 1888, we finally got to use the telescope for the first time. Now, he funded this whole project. Did he ever come and see it? Did he look at the stars? Unfortunately, he was not. He actually passed away in 1876, just as they were starting construction on the road. And he was interred in San Francisco. But he wanted to be buried at his site. So they disinterred him and in 1887, reinterred him here at the site at the base of the telescope. So the telescope is literally his tombstone. So he's still here enjoying the stars. He is, and of course enjoying all the wonderful work we've done since the 1880s. Here we are in the room with the Great Lick Refractor. Dr. Gates, tell, what does that mean, the Great Refractor? Well, this telescope is the telescope that James Lick caused to be built in his honor, and at the time it was the largest telescope in the world. And it is a large refractor, meaning it uses huge 36-inch diameter lenses to collect and focus the light. Now, I'm just, having driven up here, I'm wondering how they got those big pieces of glass here. So how many times do you have to do that to get a couple of good ones? Well, uh, the glass was actually cast in France. It came across a ship, across the ocean via ship, and then was given to Alvin Clark and Sons in Boston, who were the premier telescope builders of the day and they ground the lenses. Unfortunately, one of the pieces of glass broke, and it took five or six years to actually get a replacement piece of glass cast. So it really put everything behind schedule quite a lot, but they got the second piece of glass, ground it to the right shape, and then shipped it via train and stagecoach across the US, and then up mule cart to the observatory here where they were installed in the telescope. Are they still in there? The original lenses are still in there. We still <laughs> use them today. This is quite the high-tech looking contraption for, uh, for, for having been built so long ago. And when you look here, this is just like what we have at home on our telescope, but this is not what's attached. Yeah, the telescope is more or less as it looked back in the 1880s, and it was the pinnacle of technology for its time. And uh, now, since we use this telescope for public outreach and for public events, we've put a modern eyepiece on it, very much like what an astronomer would have at home on their telescope. Well, how does this um, compare to telescopes today? You're still using this, right? We are still using it, but not for research so much, mostly for just public education. Uh, and this now is a more considered a small telescope, believe it or not, compared to the modern telescopes that use mirrors instead of lenses. But modern telescopes can be uh, as big as 10 meters in diameter. Wow. So much larger than this. Well, this is really something. We've got quite the telescope behind us. This is the Donald Chain Telescope, and this looks very interesting. When was it built? It was built in the 1950s and used for the first time in 1959, and at the time it was the second largest telescope in the world. That is really something. And you still use it? Oh, it's still used every night of the year. That is clear. Oh my gosh. So you build a telescope to last, don't you? We really do. Telescopes are big light buckets. They sort of act like big eyeballs in the sky. And what really differentiates one telescope from the next is not just its size, but what instruments you can put on it to detect the light. 
And that's where the new technologies really get used. Once you build a good telescope, it's all about the camera you put on it. So now you just put, you add different cameras and you can see new, new things you weren't seeing before with the same telescope. Exactly. What sorts of things is it discovering? Um, this telescope is one of the primary dis telescopes that's discovered planets around other stars. Um, we also discover supernova explosions and uh, characterize them and figure out how far away they are, um, all sorts of things. What do you, what's the most important thing that this telescope has been a part of discovering? Well, I think the most important has been um, planets around other stars. This was one that until just about a decade ago, the only planets we knew of were the ones in our own solar system. And then a little over a decade ago, the first planets around other stars were discovered. And now the first planet discovered around another star was not done here, but like the next 20 at least were discovered with this telescope. Oh, that's amazing. We are in front of a large object known as the Automatic Planet Finder. Can you, that sounds very science fiction. Tell us what it's doing. Well, the Automatic Planet Finder is our newest and second largest telescope here on Mount Hamilton. And it's brand new, it was just installed this past year, and we're still in the phase, final phases of commissioning. So it's not quite up and being used yet. But when it is finished, um, within the next few weeks, we hope, um, we will be discovering planets around other stars. That's amazing, and it'll do this all by itself. It will, it'll be completely robust. Robotic. It'll check the weather. If the weather's good, it'll open its own dome, point at a star, take data, move to the next star, take more data, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all night long. And then it will send the researchers at UC Berkeley and other places that are using it their data. And what is the method by which it locates a planet? Well, it's all very sophisticated computer um, you know, algorithms move the telescope, but once we have the data, it's using a technique called the radial velocity method. And uh, that's where um, it's fairly technical, but if you look at a star, if it has a planet orbiting around it, actually that planet's gravity causes the star to wobble back and forth just a tiny bit. Now our instruments are so good, we can actually measure that wobble. Uh, down to an accuracy of a couple meters per second speed. Now, any of us can move a couple meters per second, so that's really amazing that the star, a hundred light years away, we can measure that accurately. And we don't see the planets directly. Um, we're inferring their presence from their effects on the star. Now, have you found anything out there yourself? Is there anything that you've discovered? I have discovered a few objects. They aren't planets around other stars, uh, because my research actually involves quasars, which are these supermassive black holes at the centers of distant galaxies that are actively sucking in material. And as that material gets sucked into the black hole, it gets very hot and emits lots of light. Um, and so I'm measuring the masses of these black holes and trying to take a census of what kind of galaxies um, have these massive black holes. And in the process of this, I've actually discovered around these quasars, there are lots of smaller companion galaxies to many of these galaxies. So I've discovered a lot of small galaxies as a side effect of the sort of research I do. Awesome. Congratulations, thank and thank you, you for such a, an interesting visit. You too can visit up here, just uh, be careful on the road. There are about 365 turns. <laughs>